there was an uh, there was an old farmer, which I think fits well. Our farmers are really not too old, uh, but there was an old farmer <laughs> who had been. I, oh gosh! All right, it's going to be that kind of Sunday again, isn't it? I, okay, so there was an old farmer who uh, had been farming for a long time and had always hoped and wish that year after year he would get more for his crops whenever the uh, sort of the the dealer of the uh, was sort of coming to say he's going to sell them right and so he'd always come to him and the dealer comes to the farmer he's at home and the dealer takes the majority of them of the he takes all the crops and he gives him a little bit of money and that farmer year after year had wished that it was always more but it just never was and that dealer takes and sells the, sells the crops, and he has the money, and he goes back to uh, his office, and sitting in his office, he has all this money. And guess who walks in? Tax man. Tax man walks in. Tax man's got a smile on his face, because he sees a lot of money for income tax. And so he, he takes that money, he leaves the dealer a little bit, and that dealer's pretty disappointed. <laughs> He goes, you know, if only, if only be more like that tax man. Just comes by once a year, gets all this money. Jeez, if only. If only for me. Well, that tax man has to go see the king. And he goes to the king and he takes all this money to the king. And the king takes it all and he gives this tax man a little bit of money. That tax man gets that money and he ain't very happy. He's like quite disappointed. And he walks away from that king and he thinks, oh, to be the king who has all this money and all these resources, this big palace, this big military, whew, if only I was the king. He leaves and that king is in his room late in the evening, kind of late, the sun's going down. He looks out the window in his room, out over the kingdom that he runs, he says, I hate the life that I live. It's always something. I'm telling you, there's always a threat of war. People always have problems they're bringing to me. There's never a moment's peace. And he looks out over the horizon, and he sees that first old farmer walking out in the field. And he says, you know, if only I was that old farmer living that simple, peaceful life. If only. What a story. Kind of a common story, right? It's, not an, old, it's, it's an old one, but it's a common one. That's a story I want to take, kind of take into the scriptures this morning. Hey, if you've got your Bible with you, if you've got your Bible with you, uh, wherever you're at today, would you go ahead and open to 1 Samuel chapter 8? If you got it on your phone or wherever you want to take a look there, uh, we're going to be in, for, we're going to start uh, with 1 Samuel 8 today as we start into a new series that I'm uh, calling Greener Grass. So 1 Samuel chapter 8, I want to kind of go over that today, and we're going to we're going to actually hit that whole chapter this morning. Can you believe that? I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but that's where we're going to be. So as you're turning there to 1 Samuel chapter 8, let me tell you where you're going to find yourself is the story of Israel after they've been going through a period of having judges kind of ruling and governing them, and they find themselves at a particular spot. And at that spot, let's jump in to 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, shall we? You ready? Here we go at home. Let's do it. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did, did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. <laughs> Maybe not too uh, overly... Interesting view of uh, political system. And anyways, that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, number verse 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to Samuel at Ramah. That's where he lived. And he said, they said to him, he said, you are old. What a great way to start a conversation. You're old. 
and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us. Such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, uh, this displeased Samuel, the prophet Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, he said, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they have rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Pause there for a moment. So you got, so you got these leaders, they're coming to, to Samuel and says, dude, you're old. And your kids are throwing us under the bus. This is not right. We're kind of tired of it. And we're tired of this system because this ain't working. We want you to give us a king, right? Because all these other nations that we see, they've got that whole setup going. And they've got political power and strength and economic uh, strength. They have military power. And we want, like, what they got because, like, that looks pretty good to us. And we kind of need that because the Philistines have been breathing down their neck for a long time. And they're just sick and tired of it. We can fix this problem. Give us what everybody else has got. And we'll be okay. And the problem with that is, see, they just don't realize that when they're wanting this, a couple of context things that's important to get. One of the problems is that they're in covenant with God. And in that covenant, God is to be their great king. He's as their sovereign God, he is their king that runs the nation, if you will, okay? And they're saying, yeah, but man, we want our own king. And the other side is that they're in essence sort of rebellion rebelling against God God's will for them to be a nation that doesn't do everything all the other nations do. Like I know that you want to be like them, but I want you to be different. So that when you're different, like the people are going to learn who I am by the way that you love your neighbor and the way that you take care of each other and the way that you trust me in the ways that the world doesn't know to trust me. I want them to learn about me through you. But in order for that to happen, I'm not like the rest of the world. So you're going to have to be different and sort of stand out and trust me on that. And they're just re kind of rebelling against that. So they... They want what looks appealing. I get it. Like I, I can see that. Can you see that? Like it makes sense that okay. Like I can see they would want that. I totally get it. But what they're not realizing is that they're going to get what the world wants when they seek their own greatness through the world's ways. I know what you want, but if you go about it the world's ways, you're going to get what the world gets when it seeks to do it without God. And if you look at verse 9, go back, in, go back into the, to your Bible today and check this out. If you were to look, I'm not going to read them all, but if you looked at verse 9 through 17 in this chapter, um, God, the, the Lord tells uh, Samuel, he says, now I want you to tell him all the ways it's going to be different. And he just gives them all of these all of these descriptions. And if you have your Bible, just skim through that. Just take a quick moment and just skim through that list of those verses. And what you'll see is that Samuel says, look, okay, like if you do that, it's going to come at a cost. And the cost is going to be the very things that I promised I would bless you with that would make you a peaceful and prosperous nation my way. Now, I just want you to see, like, that's going to be the cost, okay? And so the Lord tells Samuel, and then Samuel tells him, here's the deal, okay? Like, here's the deal. Now, verse, go to verse 18 in this chapter, which means I also have to turn the page so that I can get to it. Now, the people refused to listen to Samuel. You, you, this is no. That reminds me of maybe like a little kid saying, no. You know, like, no, I don't want to. No, not doing it. No, 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 no. We want a king over us, they said. So then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us. 
and to go out before us and to fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it to the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. End of story. Well, not exactly, but that's what we're going to end today. Now, can I be completely just clear about this? I do, please, at home, please do not hear me like throwing Israel under the bus here and saying, man, these are some messed up people. No, 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 no. If you went back and you went to the book of Deuteronomy in their story in chapter 17, you would read where Moses spoke to the Israelites, told the Israelites, he says, look, there's going to come a day when you're most likely going to want a king to rule over you. Like he's already told them. And he says, look, it's not ideal. That's what we tell him. Like, it's not the ideal way to go about it, but it's okay if that's what you want. But then he says, but here's the deal, though. If you go that route of a monarchy, the kingship here, then you still got to let God be your great king. And the king that he will appoint, not the one you appoint, but the one he appoints, that's going to be the one that the Lord is going to lead his kingdom through. And you're going to follow that king, which means you'll thus be following the Lord. So you can do it, but that's how you got to do it if you're going to do it right. Because that's the way, that's the way God desires it to be done. Okay. I share that because I, I want us to see today that what they wanted was not really the problem. It was the why they wanted it. If one of the great questions that you can ask yourself uh, in life about yourself and in and, and your life and is, is why do I want this? Why do I not want this? Why am I not happy with this? Why do I desire this? Why am I looking over here? That why question is a crazy powerful question in our lives because it gets to the, the, the seat of our heart, if you will, that helps us to understand where our heart is longing after. And the scripture says that our heart is to long after one place. You know where that is? So long after the Lord and the Lord's ways and the Lord's desires for us. Long for the Lord. Why is one of the great questions. Hey, if you're at home, do me a question. Would you type that in the, uh, the thread today? Why? Why? They were looking for greener grass. Throw that slide up, would you? They were looking for greener grass, overlooking a greater God. Oh, right. Looking for greener grass, right? Stand over that fence. Look at, woo! Man, that'd be good if only. But overlooking a greater God. Well, you know, um, you probably realized, as I did when I was getting ready for today, that this whole scenario is not an old one, like I said, and you guys already were like, yep, I know that. Like, this hits home and personal, right? Like, there's times in life where I'm thinking, maybe for you. Like, I have. Y'all are maybe not too much because y'all are really good. But, like, I wrestle with this, you know? And I thought maybe you would too. And so that's so why I want to talk about this this morning. You know, like, being impatient when life is not meeting your expectations on your timetable, like, that's fairly common thought to have pop in, right? Yeah. But it, it's, I mean, it, that's, it's not a new one, though. Like, that's as old as Adam and Eve. I mean, think about it for a second. Like, why, do the, why does Eve decide that she wants to eat of the fruit of the tree? Because, why, because she thinks, because she's been deceived to think that, uh, the grass will be greener on the other side. Because if I eat of this, then I will know more of what God knows. And when I know more of what he knows, then I'll be in a better place. Wouldn't I want to have this knowledge that God has? Right? Wouldn't it be better on the other side? It's an old question. And so I would maybe... Why do you need to have it better on the other side? Okay, so let me try to answer 
some of that question and challenge us this morning. All right? Yeah. Good. Okay, if you have uh, kids, if you have a child, or you have you know, um, have had a child, do me a favor in the thread, would you put, yeah, I got one, or how, you know, however many. And uh, if you have kids, if you have a kid today, or expecting, because it means you do, uh, would you just raise your hand? It's like, I have kids, right? Great, you don't have kids, Crank? Okay, so a lot of you do. Yeah. There we go. So you're probably going to relate. How many of you have worked with kids before? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, very good, good, good. So you could probably relate. Oh, that'd be kind of weird if you're like, I have a kid, but I've never worked with a kid before. Like, that's a whole other conversation we need to have after this, okay? But we're not going to do it now. Uh, anyways, do you, do you remember having, um, give a child a toy, you ever remember this? And they see the other one has a toy just like it, but they don't want what you gave them, they want what the other kid has. I don't want that, I want that one. How many of you ever done that before? See, I don't, see they didn't raise their hands here today. No, no. What about dinner time, fix a meal, sit down, you put together a meal that you think is going to be a healthy, well-balanced meal for them, and uh, the plate gets in front of them, and um, I- I'm not eating that. Uh-uh, I'd rather have chicken nuggets. I want mac and cheese. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather have, I'd rather... Who knows, right? Whatever. Somebody probably, somebody probably say, oh, I'd rather have broccoli. You know, or something. I don't know, right? Whatever, whatever. You know, I did that. And, and I got to tell you, it was not until I became a parent, and I went through that on the parent side of things, that I realized that when, as a kid, you tell your folks, uh, no, like, that actually stings. It does. Like, it, it, it just kind of hits you right here. And it feels disrespectful when you hear that. I didn't realize I was being that way. That caused my parents to feel that way. But no doubt it, it did. It's hard as a parent to hear your child say or express to you, thanks, but I think I can get something better on my own. That's challenging. I'm not trying to make the kids feel bad, because we've probably all been there in some way or another, you know? Well, um, kids, thank you. Uh, so now let me, let me just kind of uh, hit right to the, to the heart of it with the adults for a moment. See if any of this sounds uh, familiar. And we're just going to like hit right at it, right? Not going to pull any punches, as they say. You know, if I had a different job at this company, if I had a different position... I tell you what, they would respect me more. And if I was in management, I could make this company run right. Man, if only, man, I'd finally get the respect I deserve around here. If I have a better marriage partner who listened to me and did things my way because I know this is the right way to do it, this way it should be done, then it would be better. If only our marriage could be more like that couple's marriage. I wish it was more like theirs. I told you, we're not pulling punches on this. We're just going to get right to it. Politics. If only we had this party in office in majority. If only we had this person in the office for the county or the, the city, the state, our country. Oh, my goodness. It would just, it would be so, if only, it would be so much better. It's driving me nuts. If only. And, you know, since we're in church... I thought, well, might as well just talk about church because we got nothing to hide, right? If, if my church would just do things this way, <laughs> I'm telling you, I know, if they would do it just this way, it would be better. If they would just listen to what I'm saying and do it my way, this would work. 
man, if we could just be like that church over out in the, out in the country, over there, over in Boonville, I'm telling you, man, they're doing it right. If we could just be more like them or this church over here, I'm telling you, if you've seen what they're doing on Sundays, dude, it is amazing. We would be so much in a better place. Man, if we just had a better pastor, preacher, then, oh, wait, sorry, oops, strike that. I didn't say that. Don't even think about it. The grass would be greener if only. I know. Now, Alexis, let me tell you. There's some times where God changes our seasons in life, okay? And we didn't ask, but it kind of happens. And there's sometimes we desire something, and God brings about that change in our lives, right? He's a good God. He's a very giving God. Sometimes those things happen. And, and, and I get that. Like, that's just part, part of the way that God works, at his discretion. But can we be honest for a moment to, on the other side, to also say that, that maybe we run to change in our lives, maybe quickly, because we get tempted with this fear of failure. Or Maybe we just doubt that God will actually deliver us, right, out of the, what we see we're in, that he'll actually change that situation, that maybe we look and we saw a, a more appealing alternative to then, uh, to where we were at and said, you know what, that looks a bit safer and stronger and more secure, and I think that would just probably, I think probably just need to go chase after that. Perhaps we... And we get tired of waiting on God to meet our expectations on our timetable. Uh, perhaps we're not quite settled in our identity of who we are in Christ and what it means to what it means truthfully that our sins have been forgiven, that we have been reborn as a child of God, that we have the Holy Spirit with us, and, and what that means for what we can endure and overcome in the name of Jesus. Maybe we just don't quite know or understand that. Maybe. Perhaps it's from thinking that God owes me now because I've been faithful over the long haul. I put in the time. God needs to pay the dime. I need to make, like, the memes you don't want to say. That came to me. I'm like, I don't want to author that. one. <laughs> That's bad theology. <laughs> That's not right. But I, I confess to you, there, there have been some times where I felt like, God, I've been faithful to you, and I've gone through a lot. It feels like I'm due. I don't know, maybe that connects with you today. Maybe from realizing it comes from, not real, from realizing that our life is not our own. That we've been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us, right? If you know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to know that you are a child. You are a man, a woman in the kingdom of God whose life direction is to bring the kingdom of God to bear on the things that are happening in your world, in your life, where you are now. Not where you wish you could be, but where you are now. It's tempting to dream, man, the grass would be greener if only, but can I challenge us today to dream differently? Don't dream the comfortable dream. Dream the challenging dream. You see, the Bible says to guard our hearts and minds. Guard our hearts and minds. And so I want to challenge us to dream differently with a different question. Instead of looking over the fence, as you saw before, to the if only, to actually just turn and to look at what's in front of you, to look at the message of the cross of Jesus Christ being the truth of your life and saying, dreaming, how can I use what I have and who I am right now? For the purpose of making disciples of Christ who love God and others, who are growing in their faith and are serving Christ through the church. 
to look within your own grass, within your own yard, instead of dreaming about what could be that's already in somebody else's yard. Ask God to help you be content with where you are. Ask God to help you dream creatively with what something fresh and new that He wants to do with what you have where you are. Hmm. We live in a culture where we strive for power. It's obvious, right? I mean, you just see it all over the place. Social, powerful influence, political power, military power and strength. Um, you know, the, the list can kind of go on and on. But remember, power is not in the things we possess. Power and influence come from the God who created the things that we possess. He entrusted them into our care for His glory, not just for our own self-gratification, but for His glory, first and foremost. And I want to tell you, look, if God wants you to have power and influence more than what you have, I'm telling you, He can give you that. He makes nations rise and fall. He can handle what He needs for you to have and what you have to use that in who you are for His glory to see His kingdom grow. He's more than, He's got it. Absolutely can handle it. He's a pretty strong God. And that may cause you to feel maybe a little uncomfortable. It's like, you know what, I, but I'm so tired of the situation I'm sitting in. I just really want it to be better than where I'm at because this is kind of old. Please, if you love me, Jesus, would you change my situation? <laughs> That's not a bad prayer, but can I challenge you to dream differently? God, my life is not about my situation, it's about the Savior. And if in this situation I can glorify the Savior with what I have and who I am, then help me to be content with my situation so that as I'm content and I walk in it, that I'm going to redirect people to the power of Jesus Christ that was within me and the promises of God that are extended to me because of Jesus. The power of a question is phenomenal. Amen. <laughs> the power of a question is amazing. You just got to ask the right questions. It hit me this week as I was thinking about this very idea. Being in your own situation sometimes is uncomfortable. Because, you know, it feels sort of dry and maybe dead, barren, you know. It just doesn't seem like it's real life-giving. But here's, here is a theological truth that I want you to take home with you today. It's a fancy way of saying, just listen, okay? If you catch anything I'd say about God today other than God loves you, catch this one thing. You listening? Here it is. The world learns more about the, res the redemptive and the restorative power of God through the weak than it ever learns through the strong. Does that make sense? The world learns more about the powerful ability of God to redeem and restore what seems broken and brown and barren than it ever does through the strength the strong in the world. You know how I know that? Walk with me. You ready? Walk with me. Here we go. Let's come over here for a second. It feels so good to come this way. If there's something that this cross teaches me, it, it teaches me that the Son of God who dwelt in the glory and the splendor of heaven set that glory and splendor aside, taking on the form of flesh, humanity, came to earth, went to the cross. On this cross, the divine Son of God was broken, poured out His blood so that our sins could be forgiven, so it could be washed clean. 
didn't, as Isaiah says, he didn't consider himself to be right there, right? To be greater and better, to be that, that equal with, right, with, with God, but in a sense of saying, look, I'll strip all that away because I want you to know. In your weakness and in your brokenness, which I personally know, he says, I can make you stronger than you ever understand. But you got to trust me. I'll do more in your life than you ever dreamed possible. But Isabella, he says, you got to trust me, though. I have an amazing story for your life. Gavin, you got to trust me, he says. You got to trust that in your brokenness, and in those days where it's brown, it doesn't seem very good. I know what I'm doing. I created the world and I created you. I got you. And if you'll trust me, even though it looks brown and hopeless, I'm blessing you. you say, what? Yeah, because I'm giving you the grace to get through it. And I'll see you through it. But, oh, yeah, by the way, I just need you to trust me. Trust me a little longer because I'm not done. You know how I know he's not done? It's real simple. Ready? Fight. Because Jesus ain't back. So I know he's not done. He's not. He's still working. Don't strive to be like the Joneses. You know the old saying, right? Don't be like, don't strive to be like the Joneses. They have their own stresses. You look at their grass. I got to do this. I wasn't, but I'm going to do it anyways. Come with me. I was fair. I was over there, so now I'm coming over here. You ever sit at the yard and you look out over the grass and it looks really good, but then when you actually start walking in the yard, you begin to see the little bare spots? You ever notice that? Drives me nuts. Nuts, I'm telling you. You look at that, right, and you're like, man, that looks like really lush and green. But you see all these little black spots in here kind of thing? Those are spots where it's not even, right? Those are spots where it's not as thick as the other places. So you look at it and you think, whoo, man, if only. But see, the Joneses that own that go, you know what, man, if only I could fill in that spot. I'm so tired of worrying about why it just won't come in and be perfect. What's it going to take, right? I mean, the Joneses have their own stresses. You don't need theirs. You got your own. Don't take on theirs. It's not ordained to, for you to take on the stresses of the world so that you look like a spiritual martyr. No. Mm -mm. You be you. Uh -uh. And let God be God in you and through you. Do you realize that's, that's all he's ever created for you? That's what he created you for. You be you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You just be you. Let God be God in you and through you. And just let him do the things that he wants to do with you in the world for his glory that will grow his kingdom. But I want to be like, no, 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 no. Dream differently. Dream differently. We don't need a perfect life. We just need to be perfected by an all-perfect Savior. We don't need people looking at our lives thinking how good we've got it together. We need people looking at our lives and seeing how good God is holding it all together. I like that. That'll preach. What do you think? I don't need my neighbor to look at my life and say, dude, that pastor is... Got it together, man. He is really good. I mean, that, you know, it feels good. Feels bad. But it ain't about me. It's not about me. It's not about you. You don't need your neighbor looking at your life saying how good you got it. No. You need your neighbor looking at your life saying how good God is holding all of your life together and leading you and sustaining you by his grace day in and day out. That's what we need. 
Because, see, that's the life that makes it about Jesus, right? That, that, that's the life that says, you know, it's not about Drew, it's about God. It's about what God's doing in Drew and through Drew, and Drew's letting people know, this is what my God has been doing, he's up to. He's amazing. He's the reason I'm making it today. Right? Like, that's, that's where the goodness is at. That's the green grass. It doesn't mean we can't strive for greater. Please don't hear me saying that. Man, I went to church today. I got to tell you, my pastor, he said, man, you just got to be content with whatever brown grass you got. Just, man, I might as well just give up and not do anything. This is ridiculous. This is hopeless. Are you kidding me? Don't go to my church. You walk out feeling like a lump of coal. I'd, I'd fire that dude. I'd be careful what I say. Dream that God will never be done growing you in Jesus. Just dream differently. Cultivate, grow, build, strive, chase your dreams. Yeah, in the name of Jesus, run through every door he opens up for you in life and just keep going saying, hallelujah. I'm glad we sang that song today. Otherwise, that would have been odd. But at the same time, go through that door remembering what it's all about. It's not for your gratification and your glory. It's to give glory to God as you go through that door and chase it and just go get it. Make it keep it making it about Him. Honor Him with what you have and who you are as His people and where you're going. When I look at Israel's story and what we know about God, Jesus on the cross, the things that we've learned in our own lives, right? And just life experiences that we've, we've, we've got. I firmly believe that what we're talking about today, that is the life that will respect God's covenant with us through Christ because it's life about God. It's a life that will honor the work of Jesus Christ on the cross because it doesn't deny brokenness. It says, yes, I'm broken. But in that, to God be the glory. Just as Christ was broken and through his brokenness, God received the glory. And one day in Jesus, I'm going to be glorified. Hallelujah. But right now, in who I am and what I have, I believe this story tells us that, look, God will use you by his spirit to do more for his glory than you would ever do and accomplish if you just did it on your own out of your own sense of understanding. I like that story. I like it. Church, we want to keep reaching people for Jesus. We want to keep making disciples who love, grow, and serve. That's our purpose here, and we are chasing after that. And, and I want us to just, as we're leaving this place and going into the work, you know, the rest of the world, if you will, that we just remember it's not about me, but it's about me helping other people follow Jesus. So I am who I am. I have what I have. The Lord is with me. That's good enough for me. I have a church who supports me and loves me. He keeps making a way for me. I have peace in my spirit because I know this is right in the Lord. And I'm okay. Like, I'm okay with that. Maybe my dreams won't come true for my life. Maybe. Maybe you just need to dream a different dream. So that's my prayer. It's not always greener on the other side. So let's look at where we are and who we are in the name of Jesus. Dream a different dream. I'm glad we have the context of 1 Samuel 8. Otherwise, that whole statement would be a whole bag of marbles. That would be weird. Amen.